Record on the cloud. Okay, everyone, welcome to another session of Community Corner. This week we are joined by a special guest, Anna Rookyard. So this week is Community Corner with Anna Rookyard and Daniel Ridsdale. Nabil is off today, and uh, as much as he likes to think he deserves a vacation, uh, we tend to disagree. So before starting, as we do before our virtual program sessions, oftentimes we try to encourage folks to prepare for participation and align their intentions. Uh, today, I want to start by doing uh, a bit of a land acknowledgement. Um, so as a community, we, we do have the responsibility to honor, care, and respect all of creation um, that provides us with life. And this includes the land, water, air, fire, animals, and our ancestors. And the Anishinaabek people have utilized this land for millennia. And we, we have spent, we have spent other sessions, you know, talking about our indigenous land acknowledgements and, and the importance of doing so, but also the importance of bringing authenticity, intention and preparation to these conversations. And, um, you know, uh, naturally and always, I, I, I want to, you know, give thanks to Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for being the original stewards of the land. Um, but I, I always try to encourage folks when we, when we are recognizing, you know, the peoples who were here before us, uh, you know, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, uh, and any non-Indigenous groups as well, um, to sort of have some takeaway. Uh, so this week, and I'm gonna try and, and bring it up on my screen, um, Let's see if I can share. I, uh, I came across this, this resource that I think would be really important to share in the lens of our, uh, our indigenous uh, intention and preparation. And it's a website that I, I think is really valuable. If, if anyone's ever wondering, you know, why, why we, we often do these indigenous land acknowledgements. Uh, this is a website called Taken the Series. Um, and it's, uh, it's startling to me. Uh, there's this function here where I can basically toggle and just see how overrepresented over -rep Indigenous women are uh, to being uh, missing or murdered um, at, a staggering, at a staggering rate. So even just the one that comes up here, so Indigenous women are 12 times more likely to be murdered or missing than any other woman in Canada. When we compare that to Caucasian women, white women, 16 times more likely. Um, myself, I have a daughter um, and it's, if there was anything I could do to decrease her likelihood of anything negative happening to her, I would do. And it's troublesome to think that there are other men and women who have indigenous children, um, indigenous women, uh, female children that have to confront this reality. Um, so I thought I'd just bring that to our attention today before we begin. Uh, I know that uh, Community Corner is often a more heavy conversation where we speak about community issues. Uh, so prior to preparing for participation today, I just wanted to shed some light on, on that. Um, but certainly, uh, if anyone wants to have, continue to have conversation or sort of learn some more information about uh, the importance of Indigenous acknowledgements, certainly encourage folks to check out the Our Kids Network, uh, and they have a wonderful list of resources. Um, for participation, we do have a chat box function. Um, Community Corner is traditionally more of a discussion-based platform, so feel free to take your microphone off mute if you have anything you want to contribute. Um, we do ask that everyone respect one another and their perspectives. Traditionally, our virtual programs are very contentious as we do yoga and cooking, um, but Community Corner does give us an opportunity to really talk about some hard issues, but we ask that everyone um, just have some respect. Uh, and as always, this program is being recorded so folks can enjoy at a later date. So today, today is our last week of Community Corner. Um, How does that the, feel? Uh, it's good. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed the aspect of every week kind of preparing to have a really meaningful conversation about, our, about the community, but you know, that's, that's not uncommon for me. I, I don't think that that'll stop. Um, but Anna, we bring you in, and I thought you'd be the perfect guest host because as we look towards the holidays, 
So Anna is our, um, she's our coordinator for special events. That's right. Okay. So Anna is going to, um, you know, in addition to joining our conversation today, she's going to share with us how folks can sort of prepare and enjoy the holidays because they're going to look a little different this year. Absolutely. So in wrapping up, I want to, I want to bring us to sum summarize what we've learned. Um, so taking us back to our first week, we spoke about inclusion and belonging. And for those who watched or didn't watch, that's okay. Um, the, the important thing about this section, session actually happened before recording began. Uh, a friend of mine who's a young woman who has Down syndrome, um, I was preparing for the conversation, just, you know, speak about, you know, how life has changed because of COVID-19 and where there's been stresses. And uh, unfortunately, um, we actually, we had, she had, she had requested not to be featured in the show because even the conversation about soliciting those emotions be became so challenging. Uh, and I thought that would be a great, you know, summarization of how important inclusion and belonging are in our community right now. And the challenge that I wanted to leave uh, with everyone is, you know, I think, and I, I don't say this lightly, but I truly feel that as, as residents, we have an individual responsibility to our community's most vulnerable to take the time and try to connect. Um, I'm just adding more who are joining us. So yeah, that, that would be my, my challenge, certainly. Um, I mean, I, uh, I'll give you an example of what I'm going to do. Um, and Anna, I don't know if this would be your answer as well, but Anna and I both have uh, new young babies about the same age. And um, for me, I'm going to take, take the chance to, uh, to do some Zoom calls and some FaceTimes uh, with some of my family members that I know are going to be alone over the holidays so that they can see the little baby and maybe feel like uh, they're getting that little taste of family. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, there's nothing better than, than uh, I think we said babies and puppies. I mean, those are, yeah. those are things that, that instantly bring smiles to, uh, to everyone's faces, but you know, Daniela, I'll, I'll add in, in our own experience. I mean, certainly there's such a huge importance for connecting with those who are in, a, in, you know, vulnerable populations, but you know, I think, I think everyone is struggling right now. And I think it's, it's important for us just to, to make an effort to connect to, to everyone that we have in our lives. Um, you know, I know for, for myself and, and for my partner at home, uh, my partner is currently at home on a parental leave looking after our, our little baby. And um, uh, it, it has been a very isolating experience these past few months. And, and so, um, you know, I know that uh, while we don't fall under a vulnerable population, um, you know, we uh, uh, are, are yearning for that, that form of connection with other people as well. So I think it's important for us to reach out to, to uh, everyone that we know uh, over the holiday season, for sure. And we, we were so lucky, too, just to peel back the curtain a little bit. So our guests who were on the show, uh, many of whom were staff members from Community Living Oakville, uh, were actually going down some granting avenues with them to build services into 2021. So, I mean, these conversations have been helpful for that reason. And uh, from a professional aspect, of, there's more we can do. Um, so week two, as I mentioned, we, we did speak about Indigenous acknowledgements and, and the value of uh, you know, being authentic, intentional, and prepared. Uh, the main benefit for me, and, you know, I, if you do find yourself in a situation where you think acknowledging the land and the Indigenous past would be appropriate, I encourage you guys to take a, take a shot at it. So we reached out to some of our Indigenous elders um, because Nabil and I, preparing for these virtual programs, we were kind of nervous about, um, you know, doing Indigenous land acknowledgements and we didn't love reading the script and it just felt inauthentic and both of us being non-Indigenous, um, you know, we were kind of worried about really getting it right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so much of the feedback we got was just like, you, you're not going to get it right, right? That's not the point. The point is that you have the intention of trying and making authentic connections to Indigenous peoples. And um, and the whole aspect of preparing for it as well, like, I mean, even the take in the series, the website, the webpage I just had open, when you're preparing to make an Indigenous land acknowledgement, you go through the steps of, you know, searching, well, what am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? And you, you really find that, like, even that process is learning, um, you know, so coming across resources like that, that really strike a chord with you. Uh, are, you know, more valuable than just reciting the land acknowledgements or, or 
really it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's for me been the biggest takeaway is that just preparing sets you on a journey of sort of understanding that history and why it's important. Yeah. And, and I mean, that education piece is just, it's, we have to just continuously keep learning as, as a, a society. And, and, um, you know, I've been uh, very happy that I know in my industry, in the events industry, it has become such uh, much more commonplace to have um, these these cultural aspects and and land acknowledgements and um, bringing these various elements in, which has been amazing to see. Uh, but I mean, so much more work is 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 needed to just continue to educate ourselves um, until it, it 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 just becomes second nature. Um, and hopefully, we'll we'll get there one day. Your um, good seg good segue, and it's almost like we prepared for that. But uh, in terms of more work being needed, so. When we, when we started hosting these conversations, we invited in some of our Indigenous knowledge keepers and elder um, um, leaders. Uh, so now we're starting to look at 2021 uh, community support, multiculturalism, anti-racism grants. And um, I think that there's a lot of work that, that we can do from the town in the new year um, with, those, with those folks, like even just from going to connect about how to how to host an indigenous land acknowledgement i think what we've learned is that there is so much more work to do than just learning how to make a land acknowledgement like yeah. i uh, um you know angela who we had on as a ghost uh, a ghost i guess i mentioned that like we're past the land acknowledgement conversation in oakville like you guys need to catch up and i was like oh like i'm you're, yeah, so I'm certainly learning that, that we have more intentional work to do, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, week three, so we, week three, we discussed Oakville's history. So, you know, we, um, I think the major takeaway for me was that up until about the, uh, you know, late 50s, 60s, Oakville, as we know it today, just didn't exist. So we've, we've had less than 10,000 people in Oakville in, in recent memory, Men, many, many, you know, many people were alive <laughs> now, like in the 60s, like less than 10,000 people. And now as we are over 200,000, um, you know, it's not unreasonable to, to say that, you know, this is a new community. Like when the Ford plant opened in the late 50s, like we saw a lot of, you know, new people coming to Oakville as new Canadians or from coming from other communities. And we were able to see such a spike in population yet we've adapted and you know 2018 we won the best city to live in in Canada and you know now we're seeing this spike in population again and it's uh, I'd say that you know the major difference is that this spike in population is is uh, you know primarily non-white individuals of color or from you know other parts of the world as globalizations become more common and, and, and immigration is certainly easier uh, I think the lesson that we have to learn from that is that, you know, we've welcomed, Oakville has welcomed a lot of new people before in the past, and we've gone on to be the best city to live in in Canada. We have to take those lessons and continue to learn from it and welcome everyone that's coming in. Let's work together because everyone's here to work hard, live well. Yeah, I think, I just think we have to learn from that history and continue to build and welcome, welcome new folks. Yeah, and, and I mean, especially in, in, in the events world, I mean, we're just seeing uh, as we see more multiculturalism in our, in our communities and, and seeing more visible minorities and, and those populations growing, we've, we've seen such a, a huge significant shift in, in uh, multicultural type events. And, and I just encourage yeah. everyone to really take advantage of what's happening in your backyard. Um, I know that it's, it's certainly difficult this year with uh, many events and, and gatherings um, being canceled, certainly, but um, you know, as we're connecting online and virtually and socially um, uh, through social media and, and uh, you know, one day when we see a return to events, um, you know, take advantage of what's happening in our local community because we do have so many incredible uh, multicultural uh, type events that celebrate diversity uh, and, I, and I hope that continues to grow. So I would encourage, um, you know, our various groups to uh, consider um, hosting an event and, and share uh, your beautiful cultures with us um, because, uh, you know, the Oakville family and community is just continuing to grow, which as you say, Daniel, I mean, it's nothing but a good thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. I recall like there were during that conversation, we had members from the Oakville Historical Society and Oakville Museum on, and, you know, there were some dark periods in Oakville where, you know, creeks and streets represented boundaries mm -hmm. and times of day re represented boundaries for, for individuals of color. 
um, it, it led us into um, our week four conversation with Halton Black Voices on uh, anti-Black racism. And we had Janelle Thomas on, uh, who was, that was a really interesting conversation um, for me. I found I learned a lot as like a white, as a white man um, and growing up in the area as well. She, she had this great, um, you know, great commentary about, you know, just the impact of tokenism in, uh, in Oakville. And that, that really struck a chord with me because, you know, she was speaking about, so there's such a low population of, of black folks in Oakville. It's annually always less than 5%, often less than two or 3% um, that, you know, those few interactions that people in Halton and Oakville have with black people tends to be like representative of all they know about black folks. Yeah. Um, so, which is, you know, what leads to tokenism. And then those, those individuals, you know, our, our black residents like have this responsibility or feel this pressure um, from their community at large to fulfill stereotype. Um, and yeah, she, you know, she gave like the example about, you know, just having one black friend or knowing one black family, and then that becomes your whole representation of black people. Mm -hmm. And it really struck a chord with me because that was the case for myself growing up in um, Burlington and then as an adult in Oakville is like, yeah, you, you really don't have as much, um, you know, cultural experience or diversity around black people. And it was just, it was really enlightening to me. Yeah. And I mean, Daniel, I think it's been um, at least, you know, we were talking a little bit offline about just how, um, you know, these are our experiences, um, uh, you know, we're, we're young adults and, and from our experience of what we were, we were not necessarily exposed to growing up and, and now that we both are, are young parents, um, you know, there's just, I feel certainly this um, uh, hope uh, for, for the fact that my child um, will get a, a little bit more exposure and to, to have a better understanding. And, and we're certainly seeing that um, in this, you know, beautiful world that we live in that uh, is much more connected than it ever has been because of technology and because of social media. Um, I think we are so much more aware of, of these different types of things going on. Um, you know, certainly Oakville took, play, took part in the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, marches um, that have been happening, you know, for the last few months, uh, particularly this year. And, and um, you know, certainly how, uh, you know, encouraging it is to see that, that young people in particular getting involved um, uh, in, in these types of movements has, has certainly been inspirational uh, uh, for me. Yeah, we um, so you know obviously we we re we record and post all of these conversations on the town's YouTube page, and uh, the conversation we had about anti-black racism. When you talk about the exposure, it's it's not even close to the type of views that our other videos get. Like it's 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 hundreds hundreds more. Um, just I think that there's you know people are starting to pay attention and, you know, it's great. Like Janiel was mentioning, you know, it's, it's our responsibility to make sure that, you know, if you hear any anti-black rhetoric in your life that you put a squash to it and, you know, not just in your professional life in your personal life. And man, like, I was like, that is, cause there are so like, as, as a white person growing up in Halton, like, I just, I'm not confident that I've done that through my life. And like, the responsibility that I feel, you know, for, for allowing some of those stereotypes to continue. And, you know, we mentioned being parents, like, I just don't, I don't want to have another generation where, you know, people think that there's like only few paths for, for like people to go down just because they're black. I, mm -hmm. It's unreasonable. It's not fair. Um, we, I mean, we spoke at length about, just the overrepresentation of our black communities and our like subsidized housing uh, here in Halton. You know, if if you're listening to this, and I know I've said this before, if you think that black racism isn't occurring um, where you live, uh, find out where the you know. I I don't want to encourage people to actually do this. It's more rhetorical. Um, but, you know, find out where the local subsidized housing is in your community and watch a bus stop and see who gets off and walks there. Because if you're aware that two or three percent of the population in Oakville is black, not two or three percent of the population walking into those communities is black. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's really dis 
disappointing uh, and and frustrating. Uh, so I, I think the whole narrative that um, maybe our bubble isn't exposed to that that type of racism or challenge is is simply not true. As someone who spends a lot of time in those communities and in local food banks, I can certainly tell you that there is a, a large overrepresentation for these folks, and that's not fair. Yeah. Um, so the next week after that, we spoke with um, we spoke with Mike, Vice President at the United Way, just about uh, some community service navigation, knowing that now more than ever, um, people have had to rely on more public and community services and like how they how they can access those, what is available, and uh, you know maybe some of the gaps that are needed. And I think that Mike Mike did a really good job, and we had this conversation. Uh, just about the importance of the nonprofit sector. So um, for those who are unaware or didn't watch, so the charitable sector is the second, so United Way is the second largest funder in um, social services next to the government. Um, so the services that you access regarding food security, health, shelter, housing, social assistance, next to the government, United Way is the biggest one. And it's it's immense. Like we're talking millions and millions of dollars every year into the community. I think um, I think the fundraising goal last year was like almost twelve million dollars. Um, and just and when we think about practically what that is, these are your local food programs. These are your community livings. These are your group homes. Like the more the most challenging and complex human services. Uh, are being provided from the nonprofit sector. And this means that, you know, your tax dollars are not going towards contrib like contributing towards these services. They only exist because of charitable giving, mm -hmm. because of fundraising, because of volunteerism. Uh, and I knew, I know oftentimes Canada gets looked as like this socialized, as like a socialist community and government. But the reality is, is that a lot of those services are available because people contribute towards them. And that's an important distinction that uh, those services are not guaranteed to us. Um, so it's really, really important that people actually look into their local community services and give where they're able. Um, yeah, uh, we also spoke about social prescription and the town's role in that. So uh, I know we would need much more time to describe social prescription, but imagine a world, Anna, where you are not well, you walk into your doctor's office and instead of prescribing you a Fexor or some antidepressant, they prescribe to you a, a fitness membership yeah. at no cost um, because that's what you really need at the moment. Or they prescribe to you to join a yoga class or a book club. Um, so that is something that United Way is, is, uh, is looking after. And the town is certainly... Um, in the early stages of partnership there were what a lovely idea for someone to divert having to need you know more health care and just getting in shape or staying connected you know and it's funny because i think i uh, there's so many people who would say what a lovely idea and yeah. you know but i think it's actually fantastic to hear that it's not just an idea anymore it's in it's in the beginnings of, of becoming a reality which uh, yeah. is is a, is a great thing i mean i think there's we'd be hard to find anyone who'd say oh what a, you know that's a terrible idea uh getting in shape and and uh, obviously there's there's health benefits to that and so why we don't uh, try to relieve our healthcare system and, and this year i think is highlighted just how strained our healthcare system yeah. is um so so anything that we can do to support that is is fantastic news so well, I, I mean, without going into the minutia of, um, you know, what, the way public dollars are distributed, uh, everyone, like your local municipality is funded through, albeit 10% of your annual taxation or less, but they're still trickled down through our, our federal and provincial taxation. And, and we pay substantially more um, for our public health care than we do our local municipal recreation mm -hmm. services. So if we can divert some of the funds that would go towards, say, you know, some of the complications relating to obesity or heart disease, um, and we invested that into, you know, recreation, health and fitness, we would certainly save a lot of money, have people be a lot happier. Um, yeah, and just live better lives. I, I think it's really interesting. It'll just be a matter of those types of system changes often take a lot of time and push and pull. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think it'll be exciting to work in work in public services, you know, when we do now seeing that change. 
And then finally, we spoke about youth services last week. Um, and man, like every conversation regarding youth services do, it's like this challenge of, so we, we had folks from Chris Street Mission, from YMCA, uh, and from our, our Kids Network and Halton Region. And the challenge was, well, you know, you know you like we everyone's trying so many different things to engage youth during COVID and they're all like you know mixed success like yeah. it's just so hard to actually you know find purposeful engagement for youth uh and we were Anna and I you and I were chatting about this just before we went on is that like oh man I really wish there was a takeaway you know from that conversation and I think uh you said it's like that's kind of the point like I think the whole goal of youth services is to continue to turn the wheel and ensure that for youth who are either searching services or requiring services and unaware that they need support that there has to be caring adults behind the scene turning the wheel of public social services making sure that you know quality options are available yeah um, there certainly there yeah. certainly does need to be that caring adult but I think there also just needs to be youth voices at the center of all of that. And, yep. and hopefully it's it's our our responsibility as caring adults and as as youth allies to um, uh, ensure that we're, we're bringing those youth voices and raising them up and letting them be heard. Uh, so I, I hope that that continues. Yeah, and there are there are vehicles to do that through um, through the town and locally, I would encourage youth to like check out our, our, um, you know, social media feeds. And that's probably the easiest way to get in contact with someone like myself or you or some of our our youth center staff um yeah definitely get engaged because if you <laughs> if you're a youth and you're living in oakville and you're unhappy with services believe me there is a lineup of people who want to change that and make them better for you you just got to say something absolutely so lastly anna take us into the holidays what can we do to stay connected over the holiday season here in oakville yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, this, this has just been so fantastic to see these types of programs, these types of, of uh, forms of connection happening. And I mean, I think we can all agree we've all had to just get so creative in how we engage and how we stay connected as a community. Um, and we've done that through virtual programs. We've done that through a number of our events. Um, uh, but what the town has really done is we've, we've started a campaign. Uh, it has probably the cutest name ever. Uh, there's Snow Place Like Home. Uh, and that is our, our winter recreation strategy that we've put forward. And, and the intention here was just to provide um, the community with a number of opportunities um, uh, to stay engaged and to stay uh, mentally and physically active um, uh, throughout the winter season. So, so I would encourage everyone to visit um, oakville.ca. It's a simple search of winter recreation, and that's going to bring you to our campaign page. Um, and there you're going to find uh, such a, a huge list of things to do. And the, the best part about it is that it's, it's ever evolving. So uh, we launched this campaign only a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've added, you know, a number of programs that would traditionally happen indoors, we've now taken them outdoors and we reimagined what that might look like. So these are drop in programs that you'll have to pre register for. Um, but are that are going to be available like Nordic walking or fitness programs that again you would normally go to a community center or go to a fitness center and, and engage in them we're taking them outside uh, which is going to be really cool um, you know we've got five additional outdoor skating rinks to our list so so um, I don't have the exact number in front of me but I think it's like 10 or 11 or 12 outdoor rinks that we have available this winter um, winterized pickleball and tennis courts that are going to be lit up at night for you um, we've got groomed trails to do cross-country skiing and um, you know uh, snowshoeing and winter cycling so there's such a huge number of recreational activities for everyone to take a part in um, but the other pieces as well is is really again just encouraging everyone to um, take advantage of your own backyard uh, to go for a walk and you know there's a number of light displays and uh, cultural displays that have been um, incorporated across the town there's there's the light display at Coronation Park the um, Urchless Estate at, with the Oakville Museum have a beautiful um, uh, setup uh, the uh, downtown uh, Oakville's hometown holidays display again that's encouraging everyone to stay local and to support your local businesses um, you know at home in Bronte the winter edition uh, the Bronte BIA has installed over 50 professionally painted Muskoka chairs, um, nice. all by local artists. And I mean, it's, 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 it's just stunning um, how beautiful it is. And, and again, these, um, you know, local organizations um, like Visit Oakville, like the BIAs, like the town of Oakville, we, we really just want to encourage everyone to, to um, 
get outside, uh, take a look around. Um, you know, there's so many things to explore. And, and again, that that online resource of uh, that's at oakville.ca, uh, search that winter recreation, because we're going to be adding events, activities, uh, uh, even things that are posted again by these local organizations that are going to be coming up over the winter months, just continue to check it out because it's ever evolving, which is uh, an exciting thing. And just stay safe this holiday season. You know, I know it's, it's um, a difficult time. We've, we've all had to really reimagine um, what our lives look like. And, and the holidays certainly present, you know, certain challenges for people, um, you know, not being able to connect face to face, but, uh, you know, rest assured that, that we certainly are, are um, aware of that and and uh, hopefully these have provided some outlets for everyone to still um, you know enjoy uh, uh, the beautiful town that we live in uh, in a safe way. Cool. Thank you so much, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I first of all so grateful that you were able to join us today, Anna, for our last session of Community Corner. Certainly it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Certainly grateful for all the other guests and hosts that we've had previously, but most importantly to the residents who have either joined in live or watched our recorded sessions. Um, as we approach the holidays, and I mean, this isn't necessarily goodbye for me. You'll still see me at some of our virtual programs with the next over the next two weeks if it's not a statutory holiday. Um, but Community Corner has often been the place where we can have real conversation about what's happening. And I mean, my I guess what I would say for folks is, you know, looking at the holidays, what's really important? You know, what's really important to you as we go into these days? And I, th I think that'll bring some clarity in terms of how you can protect your family. Um, and maybe we just said it there. That's protecting your family is the most important thing you can do. Uh, the second thing would be to identify who really needs support. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't know someone who needs support, believe me, folks do need support. Uh, and I think Mike from the United Way uh, gave us a, a nice window in terms of, of where that support can go and how much of a change it can make. Um, one thing that I, I'm, my family is doing is we're creating new rituals. Um, so we now, uh, I had a Zoom call this weekend, a holiday Zoom call with um, my dad's mother's side. So I spoke with people on Zoom who I never would have. And it actually was like, I'm connecting with more people now than I traditionally would have in Christmas because like, it's just so easy and accessible. So maybe there's like new rituals there to kind of expand. Like, I think I probably spoke to like a third cousin. I don't know. It was really great. Um, and then I guess last is... Uh, so we talk about the supports that are available and I, I have to acknowledge and understand that maybe some people watching this may require supports. Um, so reminder 211, that is the number that will get you any nonprofit community service that's available. Traditionally, those are the things that Mike and we've spoken about through United Way. 311, this is the number you call if you need any uh, support navigating public services. Um, and then the last number, of course, is 911. So if you are in crisis, and crisis meaning that you are concerned for your safety or the safety of another, um, I know 911 comes with the stigma of that it has to be an emergency. You being concerned about your own safety and health is an emergency. It may not feel like that. Um, but remember, there's, there's always someone you can, can call if you need something. Uh, and there are so many people in the community uh, waiting to assist you. So you are not alone. Holidays are very difficult, but there are many, many people out there who are waiting to make them more easy. Um, so with that, I want to wish everyone a very, very happy holiday season, whatever you're celebrating. And we look to see you uh, in the new year. Virtual programs will start in the new year, the second week of January. All program updates will be available by the first week of January. So you can look at what you want to attend. And then we'll see you uh, the week of January 11th. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye Shanna.